You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. When we're talking about Europe and space today, it just so happens that the number three comes up. Three launches in 2023 for Europe in all, and three organizations teaming up to help the space industry secure financing more easily. It is just a coincidence, or perhaps it's luck. Hmm. And Europe is definitely trying to get in Lady Luck's good graces when it comes to picking up the pace of launches and getting more space projects financed. T minus. 20 seconds to LOS, Pedris. Go for deploy. Today is January 30th, 2024. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. ESA partners with the European Commission and European Investment Bank to enhance the European space sector. PLD Space is awarded a 40 and a half million euro Perte project. Airbus completes AOS purchase. And our guest today is Yashas Karanam, director of Bellatrix Aerospace. Let's take a look at our Intel briefing for today. It's a team up to start our show today. ESA, the European Commission, and the European Investment Bank have come to a formal agreement. With their powers combined, they'll enhance the European space sector with money, or at least better access to it. Because if space projects are one thing rather universally, they're expensive. And to bolster European space projects, these projects need improved access to funding. So while this is not a promise of cold hard cash, wouldn't that be nice? This collaboration aims to provide financial guidance and to facilitate access to funding for space projects and space organizations across Europe. And staying in Europe for a moment, Spanish aerospace company PLD Space has won the second phase of the project for the development of a Spanish launcher for small satellites. The contract is part of the Aerospace PERTE project, which stands for Strategic Project for Economic Recovery and Transformation. The contract has been awarded for the amount of 40.5 million euros. PLD Space has been appointed as sole contractor, having earned the highest technical rating from the contracting committee, which consists of independent experts from the Center for Technological Development and Innovation. The Perte Aerospace Initiative, promoted by the Spanish government, aims to cultivate a strategic national asset, access to space. To fulfill this ambition, the contract mandates that the selected bidder which is now PLD Space, must design, construct, and conduct testing on an orbital launcher flight unit by 2025. Airbus U.S. Space and Defense has completed a deal with Utelsat OneWeb to purchase 50% share of the Airbus OneWeb satellites, known as AOS, a joint venture. With the deal complete, Airbus is now the sole owner of AOS, 
and the satellite manufacturing facility in Merritt Island, Florida. The new structure is expected to provide maximum efficiency and increased competitiveness for commercial, institutional, and national security space customers. The Merritt Island factory has been designed to accommodate the Arrow 450 production line and is starting an expansion project to meet increased demand for small satellites from commercial and government customers. Software as a service company Quindar has raised $6 million in a seed extension round. The new funding is in addition to the $2.5 million raised in 2023 to further the development of software to automate operations of satellite constellations. Quindar says that they have validated most of their operations software with an existing in-space customer who is actively expanding their fleet. The company says that they have identified a critical market demand, the ability to operate multiple satellite buses and payloads from a single platform. Quindar is working with Kongsberg Satellite Services, also known as KSAT, to leverage the multi-million ops platform in support of KSAT's new satellite operations business unit. KSAT provides a global ground network of antenna that can support missions in LEO, MEO, GEO, and PEO, as well as lunar missions. Rogue Space Systems has announced a strategic partnership with Forward Edge AI. The collaboration involves incorporating Forward Edge AI's advanced Isidore quantum encryption system into Rogue's upcoming space mission, scheduled for 2025. And according to the press release, the integration of Isidore Quantum into Rogue's upcoming space mission marks a critical step forward in ensuring secure communications in space. It's a move that promises to set new standards in encryption for space missions, offering unparalleled security in a highly efficient form. A Falcon 9 just lifted off afternoon today on the East Coast, carrying the 20th Northrop Grumman Commercial Resupply Services mission to the International Space Station. It was the first time that a Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft launched atop a spacecraft Falcon 9 rocket. The mission, contracted through NASA, launched from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral's Space Force Station in Florida. So, what's heading up in that cargo resupply mission? The NG-20 mission is carrying more than 900 pounds of supplies, research, and technology demonstrations. A pair of robotic arms. A project to construct artificial retinas in space and a new method of producing improved optical fibers are among more than 20 payloads sponsored by the International Space Station National Laboratory. Over to the Space Mobility Conference happening as part of Space Week in Florida now, the conference opened with a change of guard ceremony for Space Systems Command. General Michael Gutline passed the torch to the new commander, Lieutenant General Philip Garant. Space Force Lieutenant General Philip A. Garant was appointed to the rank of Lieutenant General with assignment as Commander, Space Systems Command, Los Angeles Air Force Base, California, in July last year. And for the latest from Space Week in Florida, here's Izzy House. Hi, I'm sitting here with Lisa Dazetsky, that is the VP of Spacecom. And can you tell us a little bit about what happened this morning? Sure. Thank you, Izzy. Again, I'm the vice president of the of Space Hub and Commercial Space Week. We kicked off the morning with the Space Mobility Conference, which we are super excited about. Um, it was a fantastic event. It's the second annual. Uh, it is co-sponsored by the United States Space Force and Space Systems Command. And Space Systems Command is here to uh, fulfill solutions to their shared access to space mission, um, which we know is critical to all of our initiatives in space um, from a DOD perspective, as well as um, a commercial perspective as well. Um, it was a fantastic turnout. The entire room was filled uh, with standing room in the back as well. Um, I couldn't believe how, I mean, even the the bonus seats that we that were available, it was all filled. Yes. And it was, it was very impressive. And um, you know, really exceeded our already very high expectations. And the Space Force is equally is, is excited to be able to get in the same room with our commercial partners um, and really source innovative solutions that are required by the force um, for all of our joint forces across the, um, across the world and wherever our, our folks are stationed. Um, there was a, a lot of focus on readiness and commercial space and commercial working with 
space force in order to be able to make it to where we are able to neutralize threat. Exactly. The readiness is very important instead of reactionary. Um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the space force, of course, but as the event organizers with them, what's really interesting and unique about this conference is that we have set up the panels in a way where the audience is encouraged to participate in live time. They submit questions from their phone um, that are presented up on screen so that there can be a real dialogue among industry, um, other solution providers in the audience, and so that they can have real conversations. It's not a script like every other event that you attend. So that's very unique in that nature because the Space Force and Space Systems Command really want to walk away from this event with solutions and action plans to move forward. So what can we look forward to for the rest of the week? Uh, we have an exciting, exciting lineup for the for the rest of the week. Um, so yesterday we did kick it off with our Global Spaceport Alliance um, annual meeting. And this was the first time that it was actually open um, beyond members because the need for spaceports just continues to grow in such a massive way. And then today we had, you know, the defense, very defense focused and how do we acquire the, the necessary solutions for um, our defense needs as a nation. Um, and then tomorrow and Thursday, we have our space comp program that we produce um, in collaboration with um, the 50th Space Congress. This event is a little more focused on the commercial aspect of things and how we take off-planet technologies and apply them to bettering our planet, bettering um, humankind and ensuring that our way of life is sustained, um, as well as, you know, of course, our NASA, our exploration uh, initiative and getting to the moon, getting to Mars and beyond that. And all of the programming is aligned in ways that is um, relevant to your subject matter. So if you're into the uh, um, infrastructure and the building of the infrastructure, we have a track specific on that. We also have a track um, specific to um, commerce as well. Well, I am so excited to see Jose Hernandez. So Jose Hernandez, um, amazing person and human being. He is a former uh, NASA astronaut who applied to um, the NASA program 12 times um, before he was accepted. There was just a movie released about him, a film about his life and his journey, which is truly remarkable um, and, has, and has since done many, many, many amazing things contributing to the space industry. Um, he is now um, also the CEO of um, Tierra Luna Engineering. Um, so he will help us kick off the morning along with um, folks from all of the NASA centers. So how many are you expecting for space comms? We are anticipating about 4,000 people in total throughout the week. Uh, so um, the way things are looking, you know, we don't know where we'll end up, um, but that we, we're hoping that we'll be well over that 4,000 number. Um, but we're very, very excited because it is our largest turnout to date, which just really shows that our missions are aligning and everyone is really coming together and realizing the importance of face-to-face -face interaction and collaboration so that we can continue to be competitive and a leader in space. Thank you, Izzy. The first female astronaut from the United Arab Emirates is due to graduate from NASA's training program in March. Mechanical engineer Nora al Matrushi, her colleague Mohammed al Mola, and 11 American astronaut candidates will graduate as part of the NASA astronaut class of 2023. They will then become eligible for space missions, including to the International Space Station, as well as any other future U.S. led missions, such as trips to the moon planned under NASA's Artemis program. And that concludes our briefing for today. You'll find links to further reading in our show notes, along with a few extras that we always include for you, and ones on how investment from the private sector is powering commercial lunar payload services contracts. And there's another on the past, present, and future of inflatable space habitats. Very cool. And all these stories and more can be found by heading to our website, space.n2k.com, and clicking on this episode title. Hey, T-Minus crew, if you're just joining us, be sure to follow T-Minus Space Daily in your favorite podcast app. And also, if you could do us a favor, share the intel with your friends and coworkers. So here's a little challenge for you. By Friday, please show three friends or coworkers this podcast. A growing audience is the most important thing for us, and we would love your help as part of the T-Minus crew. So if you find T-Minus useful, 
please share it so other professionals like you can find the show. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me and all of us here at T-Minus. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Our guest today is Yashas Karanam, director of Bellatrix Aerospace. We are a nine-year-old startup, mainly working on uh, the satellite propulsion area and also other technologies which aid in-orbit mobility, right? So that is the key focus, work on disruptive technologies for in-orbit mobility. We are based in Bangalore in India, and uh, our main uh, focus is on like uh, four different kinds of propulsion technologies that can cater to all kinds of satellite propulsion requirements. So we start off with something uh, that can address the needs of the nanosatellites and CubeSats and then go all the way up to uh, geostationary satellites. So we have a diverse portfolio of products uh, addressing the smallest to the largest kind of satellites. And uh, we are also working on orbital transfer vehicles over and above the propulsion system tech offering, which can also help in uh, like de- deploying satellites to their last mile and also offer posted payload services. We have like set up our own infrastructure. We have been supplying to the India Space Program, ISRO, and we have been supplying to them since 2016. So it's been quite a journey for us here as one of early entrepreneurs in India, starting off um, as one of the first uh, private space tech companies to coming to the stage where I think now recently we had the space qualification and um, we also like uh, were able to like to test two innovative products on a single launch. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, yes, your recent news about your space qualification was very exciting to see. Please tell me more about that. Yeah, thanks. So out of the four products that we have developed, I think uh, all of them have been ground qualified and we were uh, waiting for a suitable opportunity to space qualify them. So we uh, flew two of our systems. One was a high performance green propulsion system. We call it the Rudra engine. And uh, this was a one Newton thruster chemical propulsion based on our own proprietary fuel, proprietary catalyst. And it was a brand new thruster (laughs) trying to solve some of the problems with existing technologies. So that was one thing that was tested. And second, we also tested our own Hall Effect thrusters. And this was a 200 watt uh, class Hall Effect thruster that we actually tested out. So both these had a lot of unique elements and uh, some of world's first were also tested. For example, with the electric propulsion that we flew, it was called the ARCA propulsion system. So this also featured the world's first heaterless hollow cathode on a hall thruster in space. So there have been some experiments on this at the laboratory levels globally, but I think this was the first one to be flown in space and tested. So that kind of opens up a lot of uh, possibilities for this technology. Basically, the main advantage of this uh, heaterless hollow cathode is that the cathode does not require a heater, as the name indicates, and that really increases the reliability of the system, reduces cost, reduces weight, and then uh, overall increases the lifespan for all thruster. So that is one of the things. Both uh, components of the qualification, uh, fantastic. Yeah. The propulsion system has gotten a lot of press, and I'm fascinated also. Green propulsion system, please tell me more about that, what that means. So basically, uh, almost all satellites which have been launched till today have used chemical propulsion. That has been the norm. And only in the last uh, 8 to 10 years, I think electric propulsion is a picking up field in the satellite propulsion area. So if you look at chemical propulsion, predominantly there is a fuel called hydrazine, which has been used in almost all these missions. But hydrazine comes with its own set of disadvantages, despite being very reliable, very robust. 
So uh, when you look at hydrazine systems, the main nightmare or the challenge comes in handling the fuel because it's very toxic and carcinogenic. You can't handle it like any other chemical out there. You need to uh, produce hydrazine almost close to the launch site because transportation of hydrazine at larger quantities is real nightmare. It could be explosions, leakages, which could be very dangerous for humans operating it. And also for persons operating hydrazine in their uh, plants and facilities, it's a very uh, cumbersome activity and a very expensive activity to handle and produce hydrazine. People go inside hydrazine production plants wearing suits called hazmat suits, which literally look like astronaut capsules with even oxygen cylinders on their backs. So it's that hard. And all those actually add to the overheads of uh, handling these kinds of fuels. So we want to solve that. So we have developed our own proprietary fuel, which is much safer. You can probably handle it with your hands here in a normal room or you don't require any specific uh, like safety considerations in mind. So you can just work like you're working with any other uh, kind of fuel, right? Uh, just the way you work with petroleum, for example. So it's that safe. And that really changes the paradigm because you can actually fill in all the propellant at the satellite integration site or whenever you're sealing the propulsion system, you can fill it with fuel and ship the entire propulsion system with fuel. It's very easy to even air carry the entire system. So that changes the way uh, logistics for uh, these chemical propulsion systems work. That's a theme I'm picking up with your technologies that you're developing is there's a lot of paradigm changes, which is just fantastic to hear what you're innovating. That's just wonderful. Thank you. And uh, among green fuels, there are also other options out there in the market. So people use bipropellant systems, green bipropellant systems where uh, two green uh, gases are used. And then uh, when the two gases come in contact with each other, there is a combustion and that gives you the thrust. Right? That is one of the system. And these are bipropellant systems. And then you come back to monopropellant systems. And within monopropylene systems also, you have uh, companies which offer hydrogen peroxide as a fuel. But uh, we were focused on uh, trying to like cater to a solution which is reliable, which gives you a very long life. Uh, you need a propellant which is very stable over a long period of time. Hydrogen peroxide, if you look at it, I think its vapor pressure is quite high and it's not feasible for missions which last very long. If you look at the Russian crew modules, they're uh, fueled with hydrogen peroxide. But the lifetime of these missions is less than six months because you can't use hydrogen peroxide on such missions for more than six months. Whereas our fuel can be an effective replacement to that. And if you also look at performance, so our systems are not only greener, it's not the only the green incentive that you show to a customer to switch, but there is also performance increment there. So compared to a hydrazine system, which uh, gives you 200 to 210 seconds of specific impulse, our systems can go up to 30 to uh, 250 seconds of specific impulse, depending on the size and the way you operate your system. So that's a considerable improvement in performance for a system like this. You have these innovative technologies. You've had the, the POEM3 space qualification, which just happened earlier this month. There must be a lot on your mind about potential applications or the next steps. I would love to know what, what you all are planning. So I think we have been an Indian company so far. So we want to be a multinational company after this. So we want to like also work with clients in Europe as well as US and try to look at how our uh, offering can actually come in and provide value to our customers. Overall, as a company, as Bellatrix, we are a little less known in the international circles. Definitely known well within Indian circles because we have been supplying to Indian customers here, known in the market. But I think the goal is big. Space industry is collaborative. And then uh, we believe um, some of our technologies can fit into some of the strategic missions. And we are trying to build strong reliability into our systems. We follow almost all uh, ESA qualified standards. And, and we maintain strict. Um, uh, quality control measures within the company as well. So our value proposition is three folds. So first, in terms of technology itself, so we are offering a better technology because that is a new product and we built the product looking at all the shortcomings in the market, talking to a lot of potential customers who are already buying incumbent solutions and facing some issues with it. So we have tried to address all of that with our technology and at the same time promise a superior performance. That is one. 
And second, in terms of lead times, we are able to significantly cut down the lead times because we have like built all of this in-house. There is a complete suit of IP that we have built in-house for all our products. So uh, there are a lot of companies which buy in all the subcomponents, integrate them and then build a complete propulsion system around it. But our approach was very different. We wanted to build every element of the propulsion system in-house. So that uh, really helps us reduce the lead time from almost like upwards of 10 months to under four months. That is the entire goal. And uh, we not only just built the technologies, we also built the facilities which are required for production of these at a larger scale. So we also have that infrastructure and facility chain with us in-house, which can help us both manufacture and test these systems in parallel. So that is there. And with all of that, we are able to also, like the third vertical we are trying to focus is on the cost. With all of this, we are able to reduce the cost. Yeah, so what kind of customers are you looking to support? If someone's listening and goes, uh, that sounds like that's a solution for me, who are you looking for? So anybody making a satellite, right? So we <laughs> okay, want to target every satellite <laughs> manufacturer, be it a government operator to maybe actual governments or even the satellite constellation players. And uh, we also can be good partners for even university satellite missions and all of these. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Welcome back. And an update for everyone as personally invested in the California Science Center's Air and Space Museum news as I am. The space shuttle Endeavor is now vertical and basically fully stacked again for the first time since May 2011. Much like my grandmother's living room furniture, the shuttle was fully wrapped in protective vinyl in advance of its big move. And this was just to protect it from the elements and pollution. No amount of shrink wrap is going to protect an orbiter from a big oopsie, like, I don't know, dropping it. And so last night, Endeavor was hoisted to its new home at the Cal Science Air and Space Museum, after being on display horizontally at Cal Science for years. And just like with a real launch, the weather was always a concern, but last night's move actually started 30 minutes earlier than expected. Real launches don't usually do that, because the winds were so calm and the moving team wanted to take advantage. And it took two cranes, one of which was 450 feet tall, four excruciating hours to slowly, slowly lift the Endeavor 200 feet into the air and then rotate it and then lower it back down again into its new home, stacked with a real shuttle fuel tank and two boosters already waiting for it. This was a surgical maneuver with an orbiter. And at one point, the rudder got within 20 feet of a platform, but thankfully all is well. My proverbial hat is off to the crane operators working this one. I cannot even imagine how nerve-wracking that was. Most high-stakes claw game ever. So yes, as of the wee hours this morning in L.A., it's official. Endeavor is in position in her final home, and everything is looking good. Now the work begins to actually mate the orbiter to the fuel tank and remove the crane attachment from the orbiter, and then the shuttle will be freely standing on its own. And then the work building the 20-story ocean center up and around it will take a few years. So it is off limits to the public for a good while. You'll have to wave hello to Endeavor as you drive past on the Harbor Freeway. (music) 
That's it for T-minus for January 30th, 2024. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector. From the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester. With original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.